Aloha. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak. Welcome to The Body Show. Each week we talk about health and fitness, but none of what we discuss replaces a visit to your own primary care provider. Exercise. We all know we need it. Most of us need a bit more than we get right now. But how can you know which activities are best as you get older? What are the best ways to get in a workout and avoid injuries, especially as we age? Well, we've got Dr. Rachel Cole and we have Dr. Jill Enoy here from Queen Sports Medical Center. They are based both at the downtown campus and at Queen's West. And they're here in the studio to share their tips for safe workouts so that we can all go outside and enjoy ourselves no matter what our age and work on ways to stay healthy. As always, we'll be taking calls during the show and you can join us at 941 3689 Toll free from the neighbor islands, 877-941-3689. Dr. Rachel, Dr. Jill, welcome to The Body Show. Thanks for having Hi. us. Now, tell me a little bit about what are some of the common mistakes that people make when they decide they're going to start an exercise routine. Are there any simple things that that everybody does that we just kind of have to figure out how to avoid. Let's start with you, Dr. Rachel, then Dr. Jill, you're next. Common mistakes. When I go out there to say I'm going to exercise, what do I do wrong? Probably one of the first things that people do is they're so excited about it that they overdo it. And so um, that's where we see a lot of injuries. They're called overuse injuries, which are muscles, bones, joints that are just not ready for the load that's placed on it. So one of the best things people can do is pace themselves. It's exciting to think I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to be more agile, I'm going to be stronger, but let's pace ourselves and work over a number of weeks rather than a number of hours to achieve that goal. So don't go out and do too much at once. Correct. Okay, I don't think I've ever been guilty of that. Okay, Dr. Jill, what's another thing that we should do to avoid uh, getting injured. What's a common mistake somebody might make when they're about to go exercise? Well, I think I agree with um, Dr. Cole that, yeah, I think a lot of people overdo it. So getting some rest days in, um, as well as trying to uh, change it up a little bit, can help decrease their risk of uh, injury. So, you know, instead of running, 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 maybe you can run and then ride the bike or swim. Um, as well as making sure they have proper warm-ups and cool-downs and not just jump right into their main activity. I think warming up a little bit, stretching, and then cooling down after the activity really can decrease their risk of straining muscles and things like that. So give me an example of a good warm-up. If I was going to say, okay, I'm going to go walk a few miles, you know, let's say I do this regularly, what would be an adequate warm-up? I can't just get out of the car, put on my sneakers and go. I think it'd probably be best if you... If you're going to go walking, maybe walk for about five minutes and then stretch. A lot of uh, our patients will stretch and then go full out into their activity. And sometimes that can increase their risk for injury. So maybe a five-minute walk and then doing a light stretch and then going for your full walk. Okay. And what about a cool down? Dr. Rachel, tell me, what's a good cool down? So I finally got back to where I parked my car. I'm so excited. I'm done. That's it. And now I have to keep going. Yeah, actually you do, just for a minute. We would love for you to walk around the perimeter of the parking lot just to cool off those muscles and then take a few minutes to stretch. Um, just like you stretch to warm up, we like what we call a dynamic warm up, which is that before you start your exercise, you do some of that walking and then maybe you do some stretching. Same thing, we kind of like a dynamic cool down, um, which is where you do a little bit of walking, let those muscles recover and then put them into a little bit of stretch before you hop in your car, get all tight. And, and get stiff. Is that one of the things that happens? I mean, you know, you think about it when you were in your 20s, you could just do anything. And, you know, so if you didn't stretch, you didn't cool down, whoop de doo you never felt sore and stiff. And now you get out of the car and you're like, oh, why am I walking like I'm 90? What happened? Is it just because we lose flexibility when we get older? Well, that's absolutely one of the things that happens is that um, our bodies change. So you're absolutely right that our, we lose some flexibility. So our muscles, our tendons, our ligaments um, change. So things, some things become stiff. Some things are more prone to tearing. So even the cartilage that lines our bones or, um, you know, shock absorbs in our knee, for example, is more prone to tearing as we get older. So our body uh, is a little less forgiving. That doesn't mean we're not capable. It just means we need to be appropriate in the way we approach things. All right. So good things to do. Make sure that you're stretching, warming up, and then also cooling down. What about nutrition? You know, is 
is there as much of a problem with people when they go out to exercise? Are they not? Should they eat a snack beforehand? Should they bring one with them? If they're just starting out on their activity and they're not quite sure how their body's going to respond yet, what should they do? Is it is, do they forget to bring snacks and have calories? So that's a great question. Um, one of the things we advise is actually to never exercise on an entirely empty stomach so that most of us think it's better to be on a completely empty stomach. But for one thing, we need to be hydrated. Um, and that can be water. Some people like to hydrate first with a um, sugar containing solution such as Gatorade or Powerade. Um, Certainly, I'm not a big fan of the energy drinks, the things that are high in caffeine. They can change the way the heart beats um, and the way we feel, and we don't know exactly what's in those drinks. So that wouldn't be something I would choose to hydrate with before exercise, although I do see that a lot at the gym or out at the park. I'll see people you know, downing a, an energy drink to get that energy um, before they exercise, and that's actually not recommended. Um, could the, be dangerous. Could, in fact, be dangerous. It can actually affect the way the heart beats, like I said, and create something called heart palpitations, where the heart is not beating in a, in a, a rhythmic way. Um, and it can also um, cause some anxiety for some people. I've actually had some athletes who needed to go to the emergency room for the amount that they had consumed had created um, a lot of anxiety and they actually couldn't even think straight. Um, some of the other things that we want people to do is to make sure that they've had some carbohydrates. So um, carbohydrates are our main source of fuel for our exercising. This is how we fuel up. And it we don't necessarily need to eat it 15, 20 minutes before we exercise, but certainly if somebody's a morning exerciser, one of the mistakes people make is they hop out of bed and they go. And actually, that's not recommended. What we'd like you to do is have a granola bar, a half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, something to give you a little bit of carbohydrate and fuel so that um, when you exercise an hour later or half an hour later, you have something to push you along. So that's something you should do beforehand. What about hydrating afterwards? Dr. Jill, do people get enough fluids after they exercise? Is there a certain time when they should be getting in more fluids? Are we just not understanding how much more we need? It's Well, there's always that. I don't know if you've heard before, but of course, if you wait till you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Um, so it depends on the workout. I think that people do. Sometimes they need to hydrate during their workouts. Um, a pretty common thing that we use is the color of your urine so if it's really dark yellow you're probably dehydrated you want it to be more of the color of lemonade or clear uh, so if you're not hydrating during the workout then definitely want to hydrate after sometimes people if you get really technical they'll weigh themselves before they work out and then weigh themselves after to kind of calculate how much water they lost. But especially, I think, in the older population, they're much more prone to getting dehydrated. And so for them, it's really important to make sure they're taking sips of water or the Gatorade, Powerade throughout their workouts. Also because their thirst, since um, I guess they don't sense thirst as well as maybe someone who's in their 20s. And so I don't have a specific number for you for after, but definitely if they're thirsty after they they're probably already dehydrated gotcha so hydrate with something throughout your workout mm -hmm. all right now when we talk about having people do appropriate exercises as we get older is there one particular activity that trumps all others as far as exercise for the over 50 crowd is there any particular thing that boy if you do that you're good well, I would say one of my favorites is probably swimming or aqua exercise. So even if you're not a swimmer or you don't know how to swim laps, I love that it is um, can be lightweight bearing. So, for example, you can be bouncing off the bottom of the pool, but you have the water lifting some of that body weight off of you. So it's easier on the joints. Um, you can do a lot in the water. You can do resistance training, meaning you can move your arms, move your legs, and get that resistance from the water. You have the water, like I said, supporting you, so it can lift off some of the weight that you might otherwise fatigue too quickly if you were walking. Um, there's aqua aerobics, and so um, it can be motivating. You can be in a class. Uh, it can be to music. Um, and some people are great with swimming, which, again, uh, moves all joints. It recruits a lot of the different muscles. It can be aerobic and really get you breathing hard. Um, so I like water as a non-impact or light impact type of activity, depending on how you use the water. And for people who don't have access to a pool, thank goodness we live in a beautiful state. We can go down to the beach park, like Al Moana Beach Park, um, and, and use that area, again, to get in the water. 
Now, when people go swimming, you know, I have a friend who recently started a swimming class and wound up getting dehydrated, totally not realizing that even though you're in water, you should still drink water. Obviously not the pool water or the ocean water, but, you know, you can get dehydrated pretty easily without realizing it when you're swimming. Absolutely. Um, I actually just saw a patient exactly for that. And one of the symptoms might be headaches. Um, and people might associate that with maybe it was the chlorine that caused that. Um, or uh, maybe it's the heat inside the gym, you know, in the Y or wherever I'm swimming that maybe it's just too hot in there. When actually... Um, most often it's the dehydration so just like any other sport i do recommend consuming some type of fluid whether it's water powerade gatorade i recommend doing that um typically within the first 30 minutes i'd like some kind of drink within that time period and then every 15 to 20 minutes thereafter so if somebody is an hour exerciser they're probably drinking three or four times within their workout because i think i can imagine because you're wet you don't think you're sweating but Absolutely. you actually still are Correct. You're losing um, that heat into the water and then you are sweating. Dr. Joe, what about walking? That seems to be an activity that again and again, medical research has shown that one of the best ways to keep yourself mobile as you get older is to make sure that you can do something that you need to do every day, which is walking. So is that one of those activities that pretty much almost anybody, if you have the capacity to use your legs effectively can do? Is that, I mean, if you, if you absolutely are, are afraid of the water or you're not going to swim, which I think is a fabulous exercise, um, is walking another alternative? Yes, definitely. Um, there's the American College of Sports Medicine recommends you get about 30 minutes of activity f at least five days a week. And walking is definitely a way that a lot of people can incorporate it. And it doesn't even have to be 30 minutes at one time. You know, if you do 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, you walk from the, like just from the your parking stall to the mall. But Definitely, I think walking is one of those things that a lot of people can do. It's inexpensive. Um, a lot of people have access to it. Of course, if, if they don't have any other problems going on, I think walking is a, a great way to start off an exercise regimen as well as to keep it up. Because you don't need any equipment. Mm -hmm. And you can do it pretty much any time. Yeah. It can include walking around at the mall. But if you stop at every store... I don't think you get the credit anymore. Right. Well, if you're shopping for an hour, maybe. No. <laughs> well, and maybe you get some bicep work, depending on what you bought. Thank but you. okay. So anybody could, most people could work on walking. Let's talk about some folks who have some challenges, though. Mm -hmm. What if they normally need a cane or a walker? Right. Is walking their best exercise? What else can they do to keep themselves mobile and moving without necessarily being in a situation where, you know, they're at risk of an overuse if they, if they, use a cane and they're just walking a little bit off of one side. What, right. what can you do for those people who need extra equipment? Especially extra equipment or if they're at risk for falls. Um, you, we really like the stationary bike. Um, that's the one that just doesn't move and you just go on, you pedal. It can get their heart rate up. It can work on their aerobic and cardiovascular health. The sit up or the sit down one? Whichever one's more comfortable. So people with okay. back pain, maybe they will not do so well with certain angles of the chair. So whatever is most comfortable for them. And of course, it's always good, like how we talked about, for them to see their primary care doctors if they are at high risk. Sometimes the elderly or people in the older population should see their primary care doctor to make sure that their health is well enough for them to start an exercise program. But the stationary bike is one of the safer ones with decreased risk of falls. Sure, because you're on a bike. Right. You're already sitting down. Mm -hmm. But it's, it still gets your heart rate it up. It can get mm -hmm. your heart rate up, and you probably won't fall Hopefully. if you're already sitting on a bike. Okay, so that's that's a possibility. What if they're, what if they're concerned about um, issues regarding their joints? They have bad arthritis in the knees or the hips. Is that where swimming comes and plays a role, Dr. Rachel? Absolutely. I think swimming is a great option, um, again, because it releases some of that weight that the body would work with. And you can modify it, for example, if you're if you have access to the ocean or you're comfortable being in the water, walking through the sand in the water gives you a little bit of um, working on agility and balance. Another thing I really like that's sort of a hot topic these days is just body weight exercise. And body weight exercise means I'm not going to the gym and, and lifting weights. I don't have to have any equipment. I don't have to have anything special to do my exercise other than my own body. So for example, if somebody um, has pain with impact, meaning I, I can't run and pound on my joints or I can't um, get up onto a bicycle, 
using your own body. So starting in a seated position in a chair and then just working on standing up and slowly lowering back down. So it's essentially a squat um, without carrying a bar, without carrying any weight, using your own body as resistance on the way down. And then again, using your, your muscles to lift you on the way up. So you recruit your back, your glutes, your quads, you, your hamstrings on the way down. I mean, so you use all of these different muscle groups. Um, and if you are somebody who has equipment such as a walker, you can have that in front of you or to the side of you. So you have that support. So there's a lot of things that we can do um, without having to have a membership at any gym, without having to have any equipment and, and really still get benefit. You can be in your own home and do a lot of these exercises. Well, and that's one of the keys. I know that a few years back I had a physical therapist on, and she said the first thing that she asked people to do, no matter what their age, and this boggled my mind, is she said to me she asked them to get up off the floor without using their hands. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Can you do that? No, you don't have to demonstrate. I'm going to trust you if you say you can. But do you know how hard that is? In fact, I just saw a news article about that about a week ago. Um, there is a, a physician, I believe, who's using that as a criteria. I believe he was in, um, he was international, um, and I believe it was England, and he was describing that this is the ultimate test um, for longevity, for how long and how, how um, healthy you'll be, how long you'll live and how healthy you'll be. And so the test is actually standing with your feet together and lowering yourself into a seated position without using your hands into sort of that what we call that crisscross applesauce position and then in that cross-legged position rising yourself uh you know untangling your legs and coming back up into a standing position and um i did it it took me a couple of tries before i figured it out but i i could do it um and he he used his data to show that you know the more hands that you need to help yourself down or the more assistance you need helping yourself get back up that's taking supposedly years off your life so just being able to work with our own body weight, it sounds extreme, I know. It uh, sounds like I'm scared. Yes. Okay. Don't be scared. Um, I'm scared. Yeah, I think, that, I think, though, to me, regardless of what test you use, to me it drives home the point that even just working with your own body weight in and of itself, um, it's applicable for daily living. This is what we do. This is how we get on and off the bus. This is how we get on and off the park bench. This is how we bend forward to reach something in the refrigerator. So in order to even just be safe in our lives as we age, being able to manage our own body weight in, an, in a healthy, agile way is really important. Whether or not you can do that lowering yourself to the floor without your hands, that's all right. And you have to keep your feet together? Yeah. I'm thinking that's not an activity people need to reach into the refrigerator. I mean, I'm thinking in the refrigerator, they probably can use their hands. I'm not, yeah, okay. This is going to be interesting, and, and when we take a break, I'm going to have you demonstrate this. And oh, uh, lucky for on. you, it's yeah. uh, radio that we are on, and I will come back and tell everybody if she did it. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak here in the studio with Dr. Rachel Cole and Dr. Jill Inouye, and they're both from Queens Medical Center in the sports medicine department. They work both downtown and also at the campus out on the west part of Oahu. And we are talking today about exercises to do when you get older. What's safe and how can we not injure ourselves, particularly if we fit into that weekend warrior group that loves to go out and do exercise but can only find time on the weekends? How can we make that a safe way to go about doing activity and not injure ourselves? If you've got a favorite exercise and activity that you would like to share, some unique way that you found to use your environment, use yourself, use your gym membership, or just use the beauty we have in the islands to help you get a good workout give us a holler we'd like to hear your experience and it may just help somebody else along the way you can do so at 941-3689 toll free neighbor islands 877-941-3689 we'll be right back i'll report if dr rachel did it right after this quick break stay with us the modern age brings with it an old-fashioned dilemma. Any technology can be used for good or bad, and, you know, you want to make sure you're on the right side of that and you're using them for great applications. Well, yes. I'm Kai Rizdahl. Drones are coming, like it or not. The story next time on Marketplace from 8 p.m. This evening at 6, following The Body Show. Spain and Greece are textbook lessons in bad economics. We thought we were rich, but we were not. When you hit the 
bottom of the bucket, then the only way is up. Of course, on the other hand, I don't know if we have hit the bottom yet. But Germany's capital has an energy that's full of possibilities. People say Berlin's a city that's always becoming, but never is. Get insider views of life in Europe on the next Travel with Rick Steves. Tuesday at 4 p.m., following Fresh Air. Support for The Body Show comes from the HPR Local Talk Show Fund, which helps Hawaii Public Radio sustain and grow its locally produced talk show programming. Mahalo to contributors Whole Foods Market Hawaii, Ferraro Choi, and Ulupono Initiative. Aloha. Welcome back to The Body Show. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak here in the studio with Dr. Rachel Cole and Dr. Jill Inouye from Queen's Sports Medical Sports Medicine Center as part of the Queen's Medical Center. And before the break, we were talking about a simple test that you can do to see what your fitness level is. And as promised, Dr. Rachel did it, got down on the ground without using her hands and got herself back up. Now, we were just talking about this. If you've got a favorite exercise or activity that you like to do or that you found something unique that, that really helps you with your balance or with coordination or you have some sort of advice, we want to hear from you, 941-3689. Toll-free neighbor islands, 877-941-3689. Dr. Rachel, you said when you do this, if you use your hands, you like subtract points, and the points are like years off your life and Wow. Okay. So this was a really interesting fitness test that this this physician developed. And and certainly it really could have a huge impact. I, I bet there's some folks out there trying to do this activity and we'll look it up a little later and post it on our Facebook page if we can find a reference to it. It seems like it's actually fairly difficult. I mean, you really have to have good, strong quadricep thigh muscles and maybe good, strong core muscles to be able to do that effectively. Oh, yes. Yes, you really have to work so on practice. swinging. Don't yeah. try and just do it all at once. Oh, yeah. This is not something you just want to plop yourself on, down onto the ground and see how it goes because you can really injure yourself. <laughs> I think I'd be one of those injured ones. Okay. Now, Dr. Jill, tell me a little bit about the weekend warriors. These are folks that, you know, they don't have time during the week. They try and exercise in the weekends. How can they do it safely? Now, let's presume that they've they've done Rachel's test here with the get down and sit up, and I was amazed to watch her do it. But but how can somebody who only has time on the weekends effectively exercise without injuring themselves? That's really a key point. How can they do that? So some of the things that we did talk about, of course, is don't jump in and do 100% all at one time and then, then not have a proper cool down or proper warm up. Um, so definitely like, focus on the cool down, the warm up, the getting yeah, yourself ready. I, okay. I feel like a lot of the weekend warriors, because that's the time that they have to exercise, they want to try and fit in as much as they can, which is great. But then, of course, that puts them at risk for injury. Um, so kind of just making sure they don't overdo it. So set yourself a schedule so that if you're going to go ahead and do your walking or your running or something on the weekends, really be careful, cool down, warm up and hydrate like we talked about. But don't expect to go out there and do 10 miles the first time you go out. Exactly. Maybe one mile, even though you think, I can't believe I only did a mile, you know, at least work yourself up, build yourself exactly. up slowly. And right. I think one of the things Dr. Jill had mentioned earlier was even if your weekend is your big hurrah time to get, you know, that hike in or to get yourself over to the park to do something fun, remember that your daily life can still be activity. So um, you have a, a lawn that needs mowing that can count um, during the week or park a little bit further away from if you're if you're employed, park a little bit further from your job or park a little bit further at the mall from the store you need to get to so that you get to walk walk a little bit. Um, those are ways that you can kind of sneak in. Um, one trick that um, I tell people to do is to, instead of pushing the shopping cart, maybe you carry a basket so you get a little bit of the weight lifting. If you're only picking up a few items at the grocery store, um, you know, carry those food items as opposed to pushing them. All right. So some simple things that you could do. So you might not be the weekend warrior you think you are. Correct. You might be doing more of it during the week. All right, we've got a couple of callers on the line. We have Carla on the line from Kona. Carla, welcome to the Body Show. Hello. Hello there. What can we do for you today? Well, I tried doing the going down on without hands, and that was good, but I had to put my leg behind me to get up. Is that okay? Well, you know, I understand that, and Dr. Rachel, you did it. How, you So what she did, I saw her, I watched her, is that she kind of slowly with her 
legs together, actually. I think you cross them in the beginning. You do. And so you kind of sat down nice. You didn't plop on the ground. And then to get up, you sort of did this rocking motion. So you rocked yourself to the point where you could get the energy up to, to stand up. And so if you had to use your foot behind you, you're not using a hand. Right. No is that hands. still is that still good? It's good. They technically okay. deduct, you know, a half point for not having your feet. Okay, at this certain point position. I have zero points. So Carla, you're still better than me, but okay. <laughs> Carla, you if, if all you needed, Carla, was to just move your leg, you're still a rock star. That's really okay. impressive. I got a question. I oh, no, I wanna tell you something. Uh, um I've been jumping rope since I was in probably my thirties. And um when I started, I thought I would never be able to. I just remembered when I was a little girl, I used to jump rope, and of course we did it the stupid way. But when I watched a boxer do it, I was just amazed at how you could do it to music, you know. And um, so when I started, I just kind of flopped the rope over and stepped over it. And then I had flopped it over and stepped over it. And then I'd get bored doing that and go a little a little bit faster. And then I was at the point where I was doing one foot and the other, like, right left right left and then i'd get to the point where i could just close my eyes and listen to music and go for about 30 minutes and um it's really a fun way i think even no matter how old you are you remember how you jumped rope when you're a little kid um little girls especially of course um you are the rock star carla you were doing boxing type mm -hmm. jump Jumping yeah, a rope for like 30 minutes. I realized when I was a little girl, I was doing it stupid. You know, we were like, clomp, clomp, clomp with both feet. But when I saw him going one foot and then the other, I went, oh, my, that looks like that would be a lot easier to do. So if you're doing the jump rope and you're older, you just flop the rope over, put one foot down, flop it over, put the other foot over and the other foot like you're walking, you know. And then pretty soon, you know, you want to maybe hop a little bit and then before you know it after about a week you know you're, you're doing the boxing deal it's really an amazing kind of exercise that's fun and it's and um it, it, as long as you don't have a whole bunch of knee problems i guess you know that would be the only thing that would be real restrictive but all I right to mention that perfect carla that's a fantastic way to exercise jumping rope that's something we didn't really talk about but what a great way to get in your cardiovascular activity but also do so in a way that's fun. You add some music. And if anybody's not quite sure how to do it, go get a Rocky movie or, or go watch a YouTube clip of Rocky or boxers and jumping rope. And you'll see what Carla's talking about. But you're right. I don't know how you could last 30 minutes. That's pretty impressive. I mean, oh, it's very that's seriously major cardiovascular activity. So good for you, Carla. That's excellent. We'll give you that point back for using that foot to get yourself up because you're jumping rope for a half hour. All right. We've got Wayne on the line from Mililani. Wayne, welcome to The Body Show. Hi, right, thanks for taking my call. I really love the show. It's oh, good. Everybody. Thanks for calling us. What can we do for you? Oh, no, I just kind of wanted to add, like, uh, I, I, I'm sure it was mentioned all the time, but, you know, in between commercial breaks, um, if you if you proper good form and you got a good ottoman or a foot rest in your house and you have something to base your butt on, keeping your back up straight, keeping your arms up, you know, your, your head level, your chin right, you know, your, your feet over your knees and whatnot, good weighted, good non-weighted squats, with anything in your hands, you know, maybe you can keep a couple books pressed together between your hands. Um, and keeping a lot of your body working is a good way to um, get in a few minutes of exercise if you watch a lot of TV. Fantastic. Great idea, Wade. So use the commercial breaks as a way to get your body to do some activity. And since it's sort of every seven or eight minutes or so that you do the commercial breaks, that gives you a little break in between. Yeah, and not just that. It's um, like with any kind of exercise, uh, people like think that they have when they're doing cardiovascular work or any kind of or when, they, when they have weight loss in mind, they feel like they have to drag it on for a long time. When if you can stack your intensity and put more muscles all together at once, a lot of multi joint muscles and and get your heart going really quickly, you can take a few rests and sit a lot of exercise in 10, 15 minutes. The whole basis of the P90X workouts and and the things it doesn't have to be anything spectacular. You can just Make sure you work really hard, really quickly, and you can get a good workout in 15, 10 minutes, you know? Fantastic, and that's better than zero minutes. You're absolutely right. And all of us could probably find a good 10 or 15 minutes throughout the day. So if you're if you're watching TV a lot, here's a way that you can incorporate exercise. Quick, intense, commercial breaks. There you go. Thank you so much for taking my call. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Wayne. What a great way to sort of get me motivated next time I want to watch TV. It's like, nope, those commercials. Can't fast forward through them anymore. You just got to 
Get up and do something. Another Instead of getting up to go to the fridge, get up and do something else. Well, and I think both of these callers had really good points. Um, what I took from the first caller was modify if you need to, that if you're not able to be that Rocky-style boxer yet and you can't jump rope like that, you know what? That's okay. Step over the rope. Um, that can still work on balance and agility. So it could be applied to anything you do, whether it's walking um, at a, at a, in a different type of surface or, you know, modifying what you need to do so that you can still be active. And I think from this other caller, it was be creative. Find ways that still fit in your life. I think a lot of us begrudge exercise because it imposes on the things we want to do. If we really are a TV watcher and we enjoy TV and that's our downtime during the day, exercise doesn't have to detract from that. You can incorporate it. Um, and and, and likewise with anything else, you know, if again, if you want to exercise by carrying the basket at the grocery store, that's another way to get your jobs done or your tasks done and still find that way to feel good exercising. All right. And then you get to watch a little more TV. Absolutely. Because you're exercising at all the commercial breaks. So there you you've go. got yourself uh, an extra show or so you want to watch. All right. We've got Dave on the line from Kauai. Dave, welcome to The Body Show. Oh, thanks, Dr. Kozak. Thank I, you. I just had a question. Comment about two exercises that I do. They're very, very beneficial. And then I had one question. Sure. So, um, and again, uh, I heard you talk about physical therapists, and I, I got to give them a lot of kudos. And this particular physical therapist gave me this exercise, and it was called a, he calls them functional quadricep exercises, where you sit in a chair and you bring your butt up to the edge of it, and you keep your back straight. You don't want no bend. You know, if you're going to bend, you bend at the waist, and then you stand up with unassisted. And you do that 30 times, and I'm telling you, your quads are going to burn. And what it's taught me is how to properly get out of a chair, because if you do that every time, you notice that all you feel, you feel nothing in your back. You feel it all in your quads. And the second exercise is what uh, we're calling a wall push-up, where you, your back is flat to the um, wall, and your knees are 90 degrees, and you come down to a 90-degree angle. And then you hold it there with your feet underneath your knees so it doesn't hurt your knees. And you try to do that for about a minute. And hit, you feel some really intense burning in your quadriceps, which is going to help us a lot in our older age. But my question um, is, this is exercise physiology question, and years ago I learned about um, um, we should, our cardio, should, we should maintain our heart rate between 60 and 80 percent of our maximum heart rate. And I wondered if this formula still is true and if, if your panel agrees with it. Um, so, in other words, you take your age, 220 minus your age, and you multiply it times 0.6, you get 60%, and then 0.8, 80%. And you stay in that range when you're doing your cardio, um, which for me is cycling. So, um, anyway, that, that's just the, the question, and um, I'm enjoying your discussion, and I'll uh, wait off air for your comment. All right, Dave, thanks for calling us. Love those quadriceps strengthening exercises. I want to talk about those first for a moment. You know, Dr. Jill, one of the areas that people lose their body mass over time is in the muscles. Mm -hmm. And so even though you might feel that you don't have to do a lot of muscle exercises because you think your muscles are strong enough, I heard once, and it was scary, that with every birthday that you have after a certain age, you lose like 10% of your muscle. And that's just scary. So here's Dave talking about two great ways to improve your quadricep muscles, your upper thigh muscles, because those are really important, particularly when you're walking, getting up out of a chair. These are things that result in falls, unfortunately, when people get older. So strengthening those muscles now is great. Is that is that something that those those sorts of particular targeted exercises, would they be safe for folks? Yeah, I think those are great suggestions. Um, not only just the quads, but he's probably working his hamstrings and his True. glutes too. Absolutely. And with a lot of people, as they get older, you're right, their muscle mass decreases, and that can put them at increased risk for falls, as well as for joint pains like arthritis. Um, the muscles do support the joints a lot, and so keeping that muscle mass is um, really important. All right, now let's talk about the formula, Dr. Rachel, Dr. Jill. We were both kind of saying, yeah, that sounds good. 220 minus your age equals your max, and then if you go 60 to 80% of that, then that's about how much you should keep your cardio in. What do you think? Do those, those numbers sound pretty accurate? 
they're typically ap- accurate. I always think it's really important to consider a range because I think people get stuck on a very you know specific number. I think it's important to know that if you're um, you know looking to lose weight or burn fat, you usually stay at that lower end of that range and you sustain that for longer periods of time. If you're looking um, to really improve your aerobic capacity um, and and increase sort of your cardio cardiovascular fitness, then we try to stay at that higher end of the range. But there's benefit even being below that. If that's just not something that you can attain, um, even with brisk walking, if you're still below that and you're at 40 to 50 percent of your maximum heart rate, fantastic. It's better than not pushing it at all. Um, But really, you know, trying to stay in that 60 to 80 percent is typically the advice. Well, and what I'd say to that, just to add on, is take a look at your medications because Correct. there are some medicines that people could be on that could keep their heart rate from going fast, particular category beta blockers are ones that you may be exercising really fast and really hard and say, why isn't my heart rate going up? But if you're on certain medications, that might be why. So, And I think you also raise a really good point, again, going back to know what your health um, is. And if you don't know, ask your physician if you are safe to exercise in that heart rate, heart rate range, because that may sure. not be the case. Absolutely. All right, we've got Vicky on the line from Kaneohe. Vicky, welcome to the Body Show. Hi there. Hello Hi. there. I just wanted to make a comment that the two things that I really enjoy doing are Nia, which is a dance aerobic that you do barefoot, and it's very much natural and organic movement oriented, and aerial yoga. Um, I love the aerial yoga for my spine. The thing that I have a question about is back in the 90s, there was this huge fad about eating right for your blood type and is there some similar thing about exercising right for your blood type interesting question yeah interesting question vicky because i heard a lot about eating right for your blood type and they took a look at different blood types and the analysis of you know ancestral origin and should certain people avoid carbohydrates should others be careful with red meat and they kind of based it on a blood type evaluation and you know a lot of nutritionists had some questions about that because one size doesn't fit all. I mean, it's really hard to say this is specific, this is what you should do because you're blood type AB or you're blood type O. But, you know, there was some value into keeping an eye on what foods you eat. I really haven't heard about any particular type of exercise for your blood type. Now, there is exercise for your body type. And and that's something that as we get older, we have to recognize what our limitations may be and work carefully within those parameters to make sure that we don't overdo it. I saw some some head shaking here, Dr. Jill, Dr. Rachel. You're like, yeah, exercise for your body type. Not everybody is going to be a long-distance runner, and you can walk as far as you want, but if you're not a runner, you don't have to be one now. So as far as exercising for your your blood type, have either one of you heard anything along those lines? No? No. No, Okay. But for your body type, I think that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, Nia, I give you a lot of credit, Vicky, because Nia is a really interesting form of exercise. And you've got to be really comfortable with just going all out and doing creative body movements and forget being self-conscious because you, you can't be when you're doing dance exercises, which are fantastic for you. I got to give you some upper body props for aerial yoga. I mean, if that means that you're doing yoga and you're actually in an environment where you're elevating yourself using upper body arms, biceps and triceps, et cetera. Fantastic, because that's an area where traditionally women have to work on to get a little bit stronger with upper body. And if you're able to do not just upper body exercises, but yoga at the same time, fantastic. So, you know, even if there's not a exercise right for your blood type, it sounds like you find a, found a great exercise, Vicky, for your body type. And keep up the fantastic work, because that certainly sounds like it's working well for you. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak here in the studio with Dr. Jill Inouye and Dr. Rachel Cole from Queens Sports Medicine Center, both downtown and at Queens West. We're talking today about exercises as we get older. When we come back, we're going to talk a little more about how to exercise well with arthritis and what happens when you injure your back. What can you do to help support your body so that you can keep your activity going If you'd like to join us, share your favorite type of exercise or describe something that's worked really well for you, like some of our earlier callers, we'd love to hear it. You can join us, 941-3689, toll free from our friends in the neighbor islands and beyond, 877-941-3689. We'll be right back.
On the next Humankind, comedian and stress management teacher Loretta LaRoche, the wacky lady on public television specials who finds ways to laugh through life's tribulations. Also, we visit with Francis Moore LaPay, author of the classic book Diet for a Small Planet. Next time on Humankind. This evening at 6.30, right after Marketplace. Morning Edition is everywhere. Lourdes Garcia, Alice Ari Shapiro, NPR, NPR News, Monroe, Sao Paulo, Beirut, London. Reporting from bunkers, streets, alleys, jungles, and deserts. But most importantly, we're wherever you are. Start your day with a trip around the world and wake up with Morning Edition from NPR News. Weekday mornings from 5 to 8.30 on HPR One. Support for The Body Show comes from the HPR Local Talk Show Fund, whose contributors help Hawaii Public Radio sustain and grow its locally produced talk show programming. Mahalo to the St. Andrews Schools, which includes the Priory School for Girls, the Prep for Boys, and Queen Emma Preschool. Aloha. Welcome back to The Body Show. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak here in the studio with Dr. Jill Inouye and Dr. Rachel Cole from Queen Sports Medicine Center and both in both campuses, Queens West and also Queens Downtown. And we're talking today about exercise. Why do it at all? Is there any reason why we should? Is it good for our bodies? And does it really help us to live longer? So far, the verdict has come in. The answer is yes. But if you've got some questions or you want to know what's the best way to exercise if you have a back injury or some other type of medical concern, now is your chance to ask an expert. You can at 941 Toll free from our neighbor islands, 877-941-3689. Before the break, we were talking with Vicki from Kaneohe about excellent exercises and, you know, aerial yoga, which just sounds pretty awesome if you can do that. But we were talking about different forms of exercise, and the question always comes up, Dr. Rachel, why bother? Why should we exercise? What are the health benefits as we get older to doing exercise and activity? Well, there are just so many. I think Dr. Jill will surely have more to add. I would tell you um, in the age group that we're primarily talking about, which is sort of, sort of in our golder, golden years, our older years, um, there's a lot of benefits to just getting around. So balance is a huge piece, balance and agility, um, that we tend to lose that as we age. And so being um, more safer on our feet is a huge piece to it, um, reducing the risk of falls with improved strength um, and with improved coordination. Another Another thing is um, simply mood, that we release sort of that runner's high, endorphins, catecholamines. These are chemicals that give us that good feeling. As we age, we are more prone to losing some of that good feeling, some of um, that, you know, happiness. And so um, sort of stemming off uh, depression, sadness, the blues, um, even anxiety, some of that can be controlled some with uh, exercise. And another thing um, would just be the um, sleep, that as we age, um, our ability to sleep deeply and sleep well and feel rested when we wake can be affected. But exercise can really help us get to that deeper state of sleep and, and help us feel more rested if we use that exercise throughout the day uh, to help us sleep at night. Well, and it's like an all-natural treatment for insomnia. I mean, a lot of people, when they get older, say, I can't sleep more than, you know, four hours at a time, and then I get up, and I just can't lay back down. And yet, if, if they're able to incorporate a little more activity, it might help regulate their sleep patterns. So lots of good reasons to exercise. And as demonstrated during our last break with your getting down on the ground <laughs> and getting back up without using your hands, it can definitely, apparently, help estimate your longevity which is uh, scary to me at the moment and i suspect i'm going to be challenged when i get home to do such a thing and uh, i'm going to have to practice i'm going to take it slow like dr jill says take it slow one thing i might add just really quickly about the sleep is that one of the mistakes people make is they exercise right before bed right before the time they'd like to sleep and a lot of times because of those chemicals we release some people can't sleep if they've just exercised so Planning your exercise such that perhaps you eat an earlier dinner and then you go for a walk, uh, take a, a nice warm shower to relax, uh, and then go to bed. But if you exercise you know, right away uh, before you go to bed, some people have a harder time falling asleep, and, and then they may think this whole exercise thing is a bunch of baloney. Just uh, keeps me awake at night. But Exactly. Actually, if they did a little bit earlier, it could be helpful. Correct. It all of a sudden makes that eating at the... Uh what we call the early hour dinner, the early bird special. It makes a, makes a difference. If you eat earlier, maybe you'll have more time to exercise and 
burn off some of the calories. Okay. We've got Sarah on the line from Kapule. Sarah, welcome to The Body Show. Thank you. I wanted to share an exercise tip. I work out at the Y uh, with the BOSU, the upside down half ball. What I have found is that it is great for my balance. It's really helped a lot in that. It's also almost like a meditation because I have to really focus to to stay on the ball. And then finally, it seems to have helped my plantar fasciitis. Fantastic. So you got not only the balancing benefit, you also get a focus benefit and you get a benefit towards your feet as well. Now, how are you using it? Are you putting the round side down and are you balancing on top of it? Or are you putting the flat side down and you're balancing on the on the round ball or both? Flat, flat side down, balancing on the, the round ball. Okay. So, yeah, I step up and step down and step up and step down and do squats and do weights also on the BOSU. Fantastic. And you really felt like that made a difference for you. You were able to really improve your foot health, that plantar fasciitis, that horrible heel and bottom of your foot pain by just right. doing a different kind of exercise and balancing. Yeah, it didn't occur to me for quite a while. And then I realized that, man, my feet weren't hurting me as much. They still bother me. But I think it's clutching the ball with my feet. Because you use your feet in a different way, obviously. So it's it's great. And I went I wanted to do it for balance, but there's a lot of other benefits too. Fantastic. And people can find these. It's called a Bosu ball. I think it's a B O S U. You can find them online and you can probably get one and keep it in your house. Um if you're careful and you know how to use it and maybe exactly. if people have trained you how to do it correctly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Fantastic. Because I tell you, if you know, I've 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 seen a BOSU ball. I've been on one with the round side down where you have to balance on the flat part and you can fall off. Yes. That's and in my case, yes, <laughs> in, in the middle of a class, you can be the only one that falls off. <laughs> Trust me. Been there and uh, done that. So be careful. Use it correctly. Have somebody teach you. Don't just hop on um, unless you are very not so self-conscious. But great <laughs> idea. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah, because... It's a great acti activity and exercise, and we're going to talk about balance in just a few minutes. But what a great way to really focus on that, and you got the extra added bonus. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thanks for sharing. We've got time for Douglas from Wheelie Ely. Douglas, welcome to The Body Show. Thank you. Um, I'm 62 and have just recently been diagnosed with osteoporosis. Uh, for at least the last six or seven years, I've been going to the YMCA for three times a week for no impact exercise. At first it was cardio and now it's strength, but never impact. Um, I would use the elliptical machine. Uh, so I was surprised to get a diagnosis of osteoporosis and uh, I eat very uh, healthily uh, and am, am conscious of my nutrients. Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, I was trying to avoid uh, knee problems I would see so many people in their older ages get, and I guess it has backfired on me. Um, well, not necessarily, Douglas. You know, I mean, no impact doesn't necessarily mean no weights, and you mentioned that you do some weight training as well, right? Oh, yes. Uh, I do all sorts of uh, machine weight, um, barbell uh, weightlifting. Um, so, um, I'm just wondering in my case, um, what, do, what should I avoid or what should I do? Um, I have not started any of the medicines yet, but my doctor is suggesting I start on one. Well, here's what I think we ought to do. Dr. Jill, I'm going to have you explain some exercises. Before you do that, I just want to alert you, Douglas, as a 62 year old guy, to have osteoporosis. It's possible. It can happen. A lot of men get osteoporosis. We often think of this as something that happens to women, but it does happen to men as well. I would talk to your doctor and find out why you have it. There are certain risk factors people can have. Low thyroid, seizure medications, low testosterone, steroid use. I don't mean steroids like you're going to the gym being Arnold. I mean steroids like you need them for your asthma or you need them for some other condition. There may be a risk factor that caused your osteoporosis. I don't think it was your no impact exercise. Um, but if there is a risk factor, that's important for you to know because that's going to help you to realize 
why you might have gotten into this position, and in addition, help you when you think about planning exercises. Because if this is related to low testosterone, you may have to replace that. If it's the use of certain medications, you know, there's some question about some of the stomach medicines and whether or not those can contribute to osteoarthritis. Those PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, things you might have heard of like omeprazole or Prilosec or Nexium or Asifex or, uh, you know, Prevacid. Some of those have been questioned about potentially alluding to osteoporosis. So, again, you want to find out why you have it because there may be a secondary reason. Oh, I have been screened for uh, low thyroid, which I did have for a number of years, about the same number of years I've been exercising. I've been screened for testosterone, and that is not a problem. I was recently tested for calcium loss in a day uh, through a urine test, and um, that is normal. So it sounds uh, like you've so, done some of the groundwork. Fantastic. Yes. I'm glad you have because I wouldn't want you to, to not have that opportunity. So let's talk, Dr. Jill, what kind of exercises can someone with osteoporosis do safely at the gym or even on their own? What sort of things should they focus on, particularly if they're trying to protect their knees? Right. So actually, it sounds like he's doing the right exercises. It's definitely, it's a kind of a balanced thing. You want to get some type of exercise. The the elliptical is a good one. Like we mentioned earlier, the bike, but you probably want to avoid a lot of those jumping, like high, we call high impact exercises. So maybe not going out and playing basketball or things like that, but it sounds like he's jumping rope. Jumping rope, that should be fine. Um, it's not. It, it does give a little bit impact on your knees. Of course, if it starts to make your knees hurt, then maybe that's not the best exercise for, for you at that time. But it should be safe. What about increasing the resistance on some of the machines? You know, there's one thing to go really fast on an elliptical. There's another thing to go really slow, but really ratchet up that resistance so that you're pushing hard, even in an elliptical fashion. So you're not putting the stress on the joints as much, but you are getting that muscle power. That's a good point. That is a good suggestion. And I think like how one of the other callers had mentioned earlier, if you increase the intensity of the exercise, and that does, it does make a difference. Another suggestion is um, even on a treadmill, you can make it go uphill. I hate oh, hills. Yes, I certainly do incline <laughs> treadmill. Um, Absolutely. That's an incline. Good thing to do. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've done pretty much everything that you could to try and help keep your bones strong and continue to work on doing those activities and exercises. Um, But I don't think that this is due to a lack of your activity. Okay. So keep up the good work. Keep an eye on those bone density numbers. And if you do find a particular exercise that you like, that you keep doing, you may still be able to build bone and build bone strength, which is really the key. How often should I get uh, tested by the DEXA? Depends on if you choose to do medicine or not. You know, in general, that's recommended with the diagnosis of osteoporosis anywhere from every one to three years. If you're on therapy and you want to monitor to see if therapy is working, it might be done every year. If you choose not to do therapy and you want to see if you're losing bone mass that quickly, it could be every one to two years. So it really depends on where your numbers are now and what your intention is on how you're going to work on this. Once you've done it a couple of times and you've seen that your bones are actually stable and they're not changing much, you don't have to check it so frequently. Every five years, if not more than that, would be more than adequate. It just depends on what you do about it. And that's something to work out with your doctor because it's really based on your numbers as they stand now and what your intention is as far as trying to fix it. Is there anything I should avoid in my diet? I don't think there's any foods that you can avoid. There's no particular food that has been associated with osteoporosis if you eat too much of it. Certainly not having enough calcium and not having enough vitamin D are associated with some problems with bones, but that's a lack of, not necessarily having something extra. So this isn't a dietary deficiency. It's not something that you're you're eating too much of um, and probably not something that you're eating too little of if you mentioned you did your calcium tests and things like that. So keep up the good work with the exercise and uh, keep an eye on those bones, Douglas. I wish you the absolute best to try and stay as strong as possible. Now, I can't believe we're almost, we only have about five more minutes or so, but I want to talk about exercises for folks 
with back pain because a lot of people as they get older get back pain and stiffness they want to know what kind of activities they can do that are safe what exercise is best for them what sort of suggestions would you have dr jill for somebody who has maybe arthritis of the back or they threw their back out in the past and they're concerned about overdoing it what's a good exercise for our back sufferers I think the water-based exercises is a good place to start. Of course, it all depends on the cause. Um, one thing that I really tell my patients a lot after doing an evaluation on them is make sure you don't just lie in bed though all day, which is really tempting because it's sore when they get up, try to walk around. But sometimes, and of course, depending on the cause, sometimes just lying in bed can make the back pain worse. So getting up and doing something, the water-based exercises, and I know we didn't talk about this too much yet, but... A lot of these patients, I will actually have them see a physical therapist because it's a lot of imbalances in their core muscles, in their their butt muscles, their leg muscles. And so just having a formal physical, uh, physical therapy appointment can sometimes help guide them. Absolutely. I'm the prime example of don't jump on a BOSU ball and expect to stay on it. You will fall. I have done that. But, you know, when you have a therapist who teaches you how to do things correctly, you may think you're following all the little descriptions at the gym with the little people on the side, and you may think you're awesome at it. And a physical therapist or a trainer will look at you and go, nope, you're using the wrong muscles. Nope, that's not at the right level for you. Nope, you need to add more resistance or take some of that away. So having that expertise really does help to make sure you're exercising carefully and doing it correctly. Now, Dr. Rachel, what about people with joint replacements? Is it okay for them to exercise? If they had, you know, hips replaced or knees replaced, can they go walking? Is it good to go out in the water? What's a good way to incorporate exercise when you've had arthritis bad enough, you needed new joints? Well, first and foremost, absolutely, we do want them exercising. Just like Dr. Jill said, for back pain, inactivity can be worse than activity. It's the type of activity that's important. So high-impact activity, such as the jumping, bouncing, running type sports, is not typically recommended. Um, you know, So for some people, it, and depending on their age, Tai Chi or yoga or Pilates may be something that's going to fit into their lifestyle and fit into their, um, their comfort zone. For other people, they may be able to tolerate walking, uh, stand-up paddle boarding, is a great one kayaking um, some people like to surf and can and can comfortably surf after a joint replacement um, so there are a lot of options again swimming we're looking at again the lower impact activities so if you've had your joints replaced be careful be careful because um, typically these uh, we hope but they won't always last a lifetime these new joints and so um, we want to preserve them as long as we can and minimize pain on the other hand like I said we want you to be active Now, you guys have an interesting lecture coming up on the 25th. It's going to be at the Queen's Conference Center. And what is it you're going to be talking about? Um, in some ways, it's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, much the same uh, in terms of we really want to talk about how do we stay active in our golden years. So this is really aimed at the middle age to older crowd and how do we um, keep ourselves active? How do we stay safe? We're going to have a nutritionist there, in fact, as well as a physical therapist. Good. And if people want more information, we've got a number that they can call, 691-7117. It's a free event. It's it's on the 25th of this month. And they'd like to have people register so they know how many folks are going to be there. But uh, certainly it's going to be an event that both of you are going to be at. And you're going to talk a little bit about exercise as people get older and what sorts of things they can do to keep their joints healthy. And I know what we're going to do, Dr. Rachel. Are you going to demo your little deal there? Get down without <laughs> using your hands? Get up without your hands? I'm going to have to start training. That's to a make shout sure. out because I think anybody <laughs> who wants to know how to do that. I will do it. Time to go to that event. You got to watch Dr. Rachel do it because she was really good. Now, Dr. Jill, she gets a pass because she's pregnant, <laughs> going to have a baby. So she doesn't have to do it. But Dr. Rachel, I'm calling you out. Pressure's on. Do it. Pressure's on. Well, thanks to both of you for coming today on the show and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for having us. If you'd like to hear this show again, you can click on hawaiipublicradio.org, follow the links to The Body Show, and hear our podcast. You can also find us on Facebook. Our engineer is David Chong, our executive producer, Beth Ann Kozlovich. I'm Dr. Kathleen Kozak. We'll see you right here next week. We're going to talk about more health topics right here on The Body Show. We'll see you then.